Welcome to the Boise Philharmonic Showcase. I'm your host, Bradley Berg, and this is a show where we explore all of the classical music happening right here in Boise. We're joined on the show this week by a pianist who has just finished performing a pair of recitals in Boise in Meridian, presented by Stars of Steinway. And, uh, in fact, his fingers are still red hot like embers from the fire uh, after the, uh, the program he just performed. Uh, let's welcome on the show pianist Antonio Pampa Baldi. Antonio, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Bradley. I'm happy to be here. Antonio, when I first heard you were coming to Boise, I was so excited because I knew that you've recorded uh, the works of a pianist and composer who I'd be willing to bet that most of our listeners uh, do not recognize his name, uh, Johann Nepomuk Hummel. You've recorded the complete sonatas of Hummel, and he was actually a very important figure in his time. He studied with Mozart. Um, some have said he influenced Schubert in some ways. Uh, and of course, the later generation of pianist composers, including Chopin, Schumann, uh, Liszt, and many more. What was it that drew you to this recording project, and uh, how do you see the value of Hummel's compositions in today's musical landscape? Well, this is a very interesting question. Of course, I've always been interested in uh, delving into the obscure corners of the piano repertoire because we have so much repertoire. And uh, of course, alongside what we call standard repertoire, which by no means is it standard, it's just quite extraordinary. But just to be clear, uh, the definition of standard repertoire is the repertoire we are used to listening to uh, most frequently. Uh, but there is so much more out there. And for example, one of the first uh, recording projects immediately after, actually my first recording project that didn't have any ties with winning a competition, that wasn't part of a prize, I was approached by Centaur Records and um, the first thing I, I surprised them perhaps, but they were happy, um, that I recorded were the sonatas of Josef Gabriel Reinberger. And um, so Hummel, um, Hummel um, is a figure that um, lived and operated at a time in history that to me is the most fascinating um, because it's really a crossroads. Um, it is that time when things are changing where you can see uh, that composers who were born in the classical era are developing. Um, first of all, they are pushing the envelope when it comes to the possibilities of the instrument, of the piano, but also they're developing music in a way that foreshadows uh, the Romantic era. And you mentioned the influence on Schubert, but it, to me it's even more clear that uh, Hummel had a strong influence on, on the young Chopin. Um, and in fact, some of the slow movements of Hummel, uh, both in the sonatas and in the piano concerti as well, um, are incredibly uh, reminiscing uh, reminiscent of of uh, the early Chopin works. Um, and uh, I think um, the quality of the music was the first thing that I noticed. And then the um, sort of the way that the technical aspect of piano playing was exasperated uh, in that time. There were almost um, duels uh, among composers trying to outdo each other um, to to see who could get as far as possible with uh, innovating and creating um, some sort of acrobatic uh, playing. Um, and uh, Hummel um, started out as a Mozartian composer and then evolved into a Haydn-like uh, composer. And you could also hear the influence of Clementi and Dusek in there, and then suddenly he branches out and and he becomes um, his own virtuoso composer with uh, um, basically no ties to the composers that I mentioned before, but uh, becoming he himself the influencer of the great composers that were to follow. You know, you mentioned uh, Dusek, and he's another one of those piano virtuosos that sort of blossomed in this. Um, stage when pianos were expanding and um, recitals were becoming uh, a thing and uh, touring virtuosos were becoming more common. And, you know, I had a term for when I played a, a Dussek sonata a few years ago, the Return to Paris sonata, 
I thought it sounded to me like Haydn on steroids. Yeah. You know, it, it's reinforced. It's still very much in the classical era, but there are many more notes. Yes. Of course. Yes. Um, it's uh, incredibly virtuosic, and you start to hear glimmers of perhaps foreshadowing Chopin. Mm -hmm. And he yes. was going to take these uh, things much further, of course. Uh, so, uh, yes, a fascinating period of time. And Hummel, there's another great moment in this um, biography uh, by Mark Kroll, who, who's uh, done an entire study of Hummel's life. And you, you see many comparisons between, for instance, Hummel and Beethoven as pianists. And while Hummel's compositions have not had the legacy that Beethoven's have, of course, uh, there seems to be evidence that he was uh, just as good of a pianist in technical terms. Um, yeah. Perhaps more, more of a classical pianist, whereas Beethoven apparently was better at, uh, Cherny tells us, he was better at quick scales and leaps and double trills, more romantic techniques, perhaps. Absolutely. Beethoven was... Uh astounding as an improviser when he performed in public and when he improvised uh, people were shocked because they'd never heard anything like that before uh, but when it came to um, quality of sound and phrasing and uh, the um, delicate um, touch and dynamics etc Hummel was actually considered the better pianist uh, when they were both alive um, now these comparisons are not you know, the, deciding who was the better pianist is not the important thing. The important thing is that they were both remarkable and that Hummel held his own when compared to Beethoven. That is, in and of itself, quite something. So after having studied all of Hummel's piano sonatas, of course, he wrote much, uh, many more piano works and chamber works. Um, which of them sticks out to you the most? Of course, the Number five in F sharp minor is um, typically the one that's singled out as his greatest achievement. You know, which which one sticks out to you the most? Well, I would say I would take number two. It's it's Opus thirteen, so it's it's a relatively early work. It's the first mature work, and I love that piece. Um, and it is more in the Haydn style, if you will, but it is a masterpiece. And then number five, as you mentioned, the F-sharp minor, Opus 81, a much later work, a much different work, more romantic, more uh, hyper-virtuosic, uh, with double notes, leaps, crossing hands, you name it, all the acrobatics. Uh, but the substance of the music is quite amazing, and it's a quite a dramatic work, and I um, enjoyed performing both the E-flat major um, early one and the F sharp minor a lot in public. Uh, it's fun to play them in concert. Yeah, and, and I agree with you about the second because I didn't expect it to, but it really did. It, it stuck in my ear the most. I think it, it feels the most true to Hummel's style in a way. He dedicated it to, to Joseph Haydn. Haydn. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, we hear contemporary accounts of this charm in his playing. Uh, as opposed to maybe the, the flamboyance of right. Liszt, right? Yeah. Um, he's this more charming and a little bit sparer in style and uh, just graceful, exuding grace. Mm -hmm. And I hear that in, in the sonata, the second theme of the first movement. Uh, Absolutely. I always get a little nervous, though, when I see all of these double trills to be played on a modern piano. Do you think mm. it translates? Um, I think it can. I mean, yes, it's interesting to try and play on a period instrument, but this is true also for Chopin or Mendelssohn. Or, um, you learn a lot um, relative to what they heard and how they thought. But we should also not forget that they were trying to push things to change and to grow and to improve so 
I always think that all of these composers would be rather happy to have our modern instrument if they could have. Maybe they would have adjusted the writing and, uh, and pushed the envelope even with it. Um, but I think we can safely say that uh, this music can be played on a modern instrument and resonate with what they were trying to accomplish. Yes, the best explanation I've ever read about historical pianos compared to the modern piano, and I apologize because I don't remember the author of this book, but it was a book on historical performance. And he compared Mozart's piano uh, as like a jet ski compared to a cruise ship, mm -hmm. right? The modern piano being the cruise ship. <laughs> and on a jet ski, of course, you, you need the throttle to turn, but you can make zero turns mm -hmm. uh, very quickly on the water uh, but of course it doesn't have the power of a big cruise ship and when you're driving this ship you need more time to turn the boat but what you get in return is that incredible force and power of the modern piano right yeah. right 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 yeah no i mean that that's that's true and uh, aside from power i think that what you have is um also the ability to broaden the dynamics and the layering a little bit more and I believe it much of it depends on the interpreter. If you play um, in a certain way, exploiting all of these qualities of the modern piano, not just its power, then you have an enormous palette, uh, timbric uh, palette and dynamic, and, and you can really create a lot uh, more vivid um, and kaleidoscopic um, renditions of this music, which I think the composers would have been happy with. Let's go ahead and listen to one of Hummel's finest piano sonatas, the first movement of his fifth sonata in F-sharp minor, Opus 81, performed here by Antonio Pompabaldi.
The first movement of Johann Nepomuk Hummel's Sonata in F-sharp minor, opus 81. That's his fifth sonata and widely considered by many to be his very best. That was pianist Antonio Pompobaldi. You're listening to the Boise Philharmonic Showcase. I'm your host, Bradley Berg. Let's continue our conversation with pianist Antonio Pompobaldi regarding his major recording projects. Moving on from Hummel, another composer whose works uh, you've recorded completely, at least the, piano, the solo piano works, is Edvard Grieg. I actually I recorded also all the chamber music in terms of uh, his cello sonata in intermezzo and the three violin sonatas and the piano concerto. Okay, so essentially all of his piano yeah. music. Yeah. yeah. Um, what a project. What a gargantuan project. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was immediately after the Rheinberger project. So Centaur asked me, what next? And so I said, well, this one might require a little time <laughs> um, because it's a bit longer. And But they were very happy to go along with it. I was lucky to, to have them as partners in, in this project. And because I've always loved Grieg. Um, there was a time in my younger years where I was only 18 years old and I was at the time uh, almost um, finished with school. I was very close to starting a recording project with a label that then unfortunately folded. Um, but that would have been my first recording and I had already um, the idea of recording all Greek. Uh, I hadn't learned all Greek, uh, but I had learned enough to know that I loved the composer. And some people sometimes ask me, how come that a Southern European, a Southern you know, Italian, um, love so much a Norwegian composer. But I think that uh, Grieg gets typecast a little bit as a regional composer, but his music is utterly universal and fantastic. He's such a genius, and um, his music resonates with me because it's so direct, so emotional without being sentimental, so inspired, so melodic and harmonically interesting. And also there is a lot of variety in it. You mentioned Greg being typecast, and uh, I pulled this quote because as a musicologist, I'm really interested in reception history, and it's so fascinating to hear and read critiques and, and critical reviews from over 100 years ago. And so I found this old book written in 1902 by someone named a uh, young music critic. He was 29 at the time, named Daniel Gregory Mason, American critic. And I don't necessarily agree with the quote, but it's interesting to read uh, his opinion of maybe the American perspective of Grieg in 1902. So this is Mason writing. To the musical amateur, no contemporary composer is better known than Grieg. Every schoolgirl plays his piano pieces. Young violinists study his delightfully melodious sonatas. And few concert pieces are more widely loved than the Per Gint Suite. Yet from the professional musicians, Grieg does not meet with such favor. Many speak of him patronizingly, some scornfully. Grieg, they say? Oh yes, very charming, but... And the sentence ends with a shrug. The reason for this discrepancy of estimate seems to be that the layman, fascinated by Grieg's lovely melodies, unusual and piquant harmonic treatment and contagious rhythm, looks for no further quality but the musician unconsciously referring all music to a standard based on works of greater solidity is too conscious of the shortcomings of this Norwegian minstrelsy to do justice to his quantities. So he's basically saying that there's a limitation. Yeah, there's no in, substance to it. Yeah, yeah. But there is depth and there is substance in reality. Yes. And there is innovation. And there is, uh, you know, if you consider that people like Ravel and Debussy said that they were greatly inspired by by Grieg and even Bartok. Mm. Um, and, but aside from that, I don't need any other person, no matter how great, to tell me. I just find that greatness in Grieg's music immediately. Um, and substance is a funny thing because uh, some people, uh, they, they expect uh, the music always to have this Germanic um, quality in terms of a gigantic form, like the Brahms sonatas or concertos, etc. But there can be a lot of substance in miniatures, as we know. Yes, and this idea you mentioned, Bartok. You know, I, I wrote a paper about Grieg the modernist, and I focused on the schlatter, the yes. Norwegian peasant dances. Yes. It was a very surprising discovery for me mm. uh, a few years ago to hear these pieces for the first time. And someone told me, you know, Grieg is 
he's he's early. He's not a modernist. And I, I thought, well, no. I mean, you listen to these things, and not only do you hear that almost radical. I mean, he said to the end of his life that he would continue developing as a composer. You hear that the composers around this time were taking folk material very seriously, uh, like Bartok, absolutely, uh, Percy, Percy Granger, yeah. among others. Um, but I also hear in some of those works, there's a contrast that Grieg sets up. He said he was elevating these pieces uh, from the, their Hardanger fiddle origins, exactly. right? Yeah. Folk fiddling origins to a higher plane of concert music. And in some of them, you hear Grieg, of course, he studied at the Leipzig Conservatory, very traditional German. And hated it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hated his time of, there. He But flexes he... his muscles a yeah. little bit, and you hear the yeah. counterpoint in the stretto Absolutely. voices. But then he goes back to the, you know, fairy world or of mythology of Absolutely. Norwegian folklore. When you think about it, this is similar to what Chopin did with the mazurkas, mm. you know, where which to me, how great the music of Chopin is, but the mazurkas are his best uh, as a opus, if you consider all of them. And that's exactly what he was doing. He was elevating it to an art form, um, this popular music. Antonio's comment there about Grieg's Norwegian peasant dances, I think, is so insightful. These really are sort of like the mazurkas of the north. In these dances, Grieg took some folk tunes from a peculiar type of Norwegian fiddle called the Hardanger fiddle. You'll hear a lot of really lively dance-like figurations and some nuanced ornamentation. Here are a few of my favorites from that set.
few Norwegian peasant dances by Edvard Grieg, performed there by pianist Antonio Pompobaldi. Let's return to our discussion regarding Antonio's more recent projects. Here's a taste of that, a short prelude by Roberto Piana, based on a painting of a young girl. The last composer I want to ask you about is actually one we heard this evening and this weekend, uh, Roberto Piana. You have a very special collaborative working relationship with this composer. Tell us about, about that. Yeah, I mean, he is Italian. He's from the island of Sardinia. He's an excellent pianist and great composer. He teaches piano at the conservatory in Sassari. That's his city uh, in, on the island of Sardinia. And um, we met by chance. Uh, I just stumbled upon uh, a video on YouTube where he himself played one of his own compositions. It was called Homenaje a Joaquin Turina. So, homage to Joaquin Turina. Um, and I was immediately uh, struck by the beauty of this work. And then I contacted him and we started um, a conversation online. Um, and... Um, I was going to play a recital in San Francisco for the List Society, for the American List Society. And I had a program in mind, which, if I'm not mistaken, started with, it was all uh, mostly uh, works inspired or dedicated to List. So I was going to start with the Lyapunov Transcendental Etude Number 12, Elegy in Memory of Franz Liszt. And then the first half continued with the 12 Etudes Opus 10 of Chopin, dedicated to Franz Liszt. And then the second half had uh, some works original by Liszt. I remember Sposalizio and then the Ernani paraphrase from Verdi. And I don't remember what else was there. Something else was there. And then I wanted to close the concert with something new, something newly composed. So I asked Roberto if he was willing to write something inspired by Liszt. And he wrote a beautifully humorous uh, pastiche um, in which there is a light motif, which is his own, um, sort of a promenade in the style of Mussorgsky, taking us to admire, but without stopping between movements. It's in one movement. And, um, and then there is plenty of quotes from Liszt himself. Uh, and the title itself is a quote, um, because the piece he called After a Reading of Liszt. So obviously Liszt wrote After a Reading of Dante. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Roberto titled this piece um, after a reading of Liszt. And I performed it, I loved it, um, and performed it and even recorded it. Um, and then we continued collaborating. This was over 10 years ago. Then he wrote for me elaborations, concert elaborations of the Edith Piaf songs, which I paired with my own transcriptions of the uh, Poulenc uh, pieces for voice and piano. Um, and then he wrote uh, opera paraphrases on La Boheme and uh, Carmen for me. And he wrote concert versions of Neapolitan songs, classical Neapolitan songs, which I all recorded. He wrote a piano sonata for me. And uh, I also recorded his beautiful 25 pictorial preludes, which are an amazing work. He didn't write those for me. He uh, had already composed them when I met him, but I paired them with the sonata uh, on a Centaur Records album. Um, and many other things, a piano concerto and uh, a two piano sonata, which I played with my wife and you know, a lot of other things, uh, pieces for flute and piano. I love his music. I love him as a composer. So I always nudge him to write more. And uh, he, I also love the fact that he's very uh, versatile and eclectic. And um, uh, obviously the latest piece that he wrote for me is this uh, almost one hour long um, uh, composition called Glances on the Divine Comedy, um, which he wrote for the 700th year of the passing of Dante Alighieri. And um, I've been performing the first book of it, um, Inferno, 
in concert for the past two years in five continents and you know many many times and um i've recorded already the whole thing and it will um come out um on the steinway and sons label um the whole um glances on the divine comedy by roberto piana plus the list dante sonata so that will be the the cd we look forward to that release I was reading a uh, blog post on your website from 2020, which, to to paraphrase a little bit, you were talking about writing about how the contemporary public uh, oftentimes has sort of a negative uh, view or at best apprehensive view of uh, a lot of modern music. And uh, you make the case, I think convincingly, that piano's style could perhaps um, maybe help today's audience overcome that view a little bit, that, it, that it's nicely balanced in that way. Could you describe that style a little bit? Well, I think that uh, Roberto is fundamentally an Italian composer, and I say that knowing that it may not mean much unless I qualify. Um, I mean, there is a lyrical quality to what he writes. There is always a, a melodic strain, um, but there is influences from the French impressionistic world, world and also from jazz and uh, from all sorts of other places. Um, it may not be so evident, uh, the, the impression is, well, some of it in the glances as well, um, but the jazz style, although there is some bluesy chords in Inferno, <laughs> um, but um, in other pieces like the pictorial preludes, um, there is a, a profound spirituality to his music, which I love as well. Um, and of course, he mastered all of the compositional techniques um, ultimately, I think he tries to express images through his music uh, and to communicate emotions. And what I was trying to say in that uh, essay was that um, we had come to a point where um, a lot of co- contemporary composers, um, in general, uh, they almost made it a point to become so complex and complicated and move away from the audience and also almost making it like a, a badge of honor to be worn with pride uh, if audiences didn't like their compositions. And fortunately, the trend has changed, and we have plenty of composers who didn't do that, and especially nowadays, they are more accepted than they were because those composers were also controlling what the audience could consume in terms of contemporary music, and they were um, shouting so loudly against um these composers that didn't follow them, so to speak. So I feel fortunate that even we have even seen a return to tonality in a way, although incorporating more modern language, but um, tonality wasn't done after all. And there is, uh, to paraphrase a famous uh, sentence, there is a lot of great music still to be written in the key of C. Yes, <laughs> yes, came to my mind at the exact same time. So we'll, we'll play a few of those. Um, they're picturesque. Preludes? Yeah, the pictorial preludes. Pictorial preludes. We'll play a few of those um, to wrap up the show. Antonio, thank you so much for joining us here on the Boise Philharmonic Showcase. We're so lucky. I find myself, I keep telling people here in Boise, we we have more great music and great musicians coming here than perhaps uh, we should for a place our size. So um, we're we're outdoing ourselves, and and we're so lucky to have um, performers like yourself come through here. And thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Bradley. Thanks.
We just heard the first nine of the 25 total pictorial preludes by the Italian composer Roberto Piana. Those were performed by his trusted collaborator, Antonio Pompabaldi, who visited Boise in January 2024 for a recital presented by Stars of Steinway. That concludes this week's episode of the Boise Philharmonic Showcase. Thank you.